Hello and welcome to this, the next episode in Beyond the Park. And today we are going to be delving into the deep end with one of the most infamous marine reptiles ever shown on screen and an animal rumoured to be coming in Jurassic World Evolution 2. No, not you Mosasaurus, you get back in your cage. But before we get into it, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe if you're new here for more dinosaur videos, gaming and gameplay of the upcoming Jurassic World Evolution 2. Now, with the usual YouTuber stuff out of the way, let's take a trip back in time to the year 1999. I was but a young dinosaur fan when Walking with Dinosaurs hit the TV, and it became an overnight success. I think for many who have grown up in a post-CGI documentary world, it's hard to explain just how influential it was when it came onto our screens. But it was episode 3 that left the biggest mark and the most memorable animal for me. A simple brown, dirty dinosaur on the edge of a coastline. Nothing special about that, until out of the waves came this pair of jaws, and just like that it was gone. Liplorodon would go on to make its mark throughout the episode, tearing an Ophthalmosaurus in half and more. This magnificent animal left a legacy amongst many dinosaur fans, but what is the real story behind this magical marine reptile? Well let's start at the beginning. Marine reptiles from the Mesozoic era come in several different groups. The first, the ichthyosaurs, are distinctive thanks to their dolphin-like bodies. They evolved streamlined shapes and powerful rear fins and were probably fast and agile reptiles. Evolving and living alongside these were the plesiosaurs. These bulbous creatures decided that chonk was the way to go. Flippers, rather than a dolphin body shape, was better. Plesiosaurs come in two main types. The plesiosauromorphs had small heads and long necks. Then there were the beefier, short-necked pliosauromorphs, which had much bigger heads. Lyoplorodon belongs to the latter, and although recent research has revealed there may not be such a distinctive difference between these two groups, I'll be sticking with calling Lyoplorodon a pliosaur for the rest of this video. Lyoplorodon itself has a very complicated past. Upon its original discovery, there were no less than three separate species of the reptile. The genus name of Lyoplorodon was coined by Henri Almiel Sauvage in 1873. He named three species, each one based on a single tooth, and the tooth gives Liplorodon its name, meaning smooth-sided tooth. The first, called Liplorodon ferox, was discovered near Boulogne-sur-Mer in France. The second, Liplorodon grossoveri, was found near Charlet, France. A third species was eventually moved and given its own genus. The other two still remain. More Liplorodon fossils have been found in France and England, with more or less full skeletons of the Ferox subspecies being found. Liplorodon's skeleton shows many features common to pliosaurs and plesiosaurs, and some interesting adaptations for its unique habitat. You can see from this simple view the general plan for most plesiosaurids. Four large flippers whose great surface area would have been effective for locomotion, a short tail for balance and stiffness, and in Liprorodon's case, a stout neck and a large head. Liprorodon's skull itself indicates some useful traits for a powerful predator. The eyes are located towards the top of the skull, which might mean that this predator mostly attacked from below, striking its prey in ambush, similar to how great white sharks attack today. Some have also theorised that Liprorodon due to its nostril arrangement, may have had a directional sense of smell, able to track prey in water in stereo vision, similar to how land-based animals track prey using sound. Its teeth were also massive. Some of its teeth measured up to 18 inches long, making them bigger than even a Tyrannosaurus tooth. You would not want to get on the bad side of a magical Leoplorodon. Research done on the other similar pl pliosaurids indicate that the bite force of these animals might have been as high as 33,000 pounds per square inch. That's over double the estimates for Tyrannosaurus, and nearly 10 times as powerful as a modern day alligator. So let's move on to locomotion, or the bigger question, why flippers? Unlike the ichthyosaurs who went for a streamlined shape, the plesiosaurs and pliosaurs evolved larger stockier bodies and four flippers. Such a method for locomotion is inherently inefficient when compared with the ichthyosaur body plan, but flippers do have some distinct advantages. In one scientific study which I've linked down below in the comments, a robotic plesiosaur was created with flippers 
in order to test different methods of flipper-based propulsion, and it showed some interesting results. It seems likely the plesiosaurs used all four flippers in conjunction for forward locomotion, and they would have been able to achieve significant velocities with powerful strokes like this. However, the study also theorised that modification to the angles of the flippers, or the timing of the rear flippers compared to the forward flippers, could cause interactions with the vortices of water coming off each pair, aiding the animal by reducing speed rapidly. The animal may have even been able to offset the flippers on each side of its body, allowing them to rapidly reduce speed on one side and increase on the other, turning sharply similar to how a tank steers fast by breaking one track. In essence, flippers give plesiosaurs and pliosaurs considerable options for locomotion compared to just a singular large rear thin seen in things like ichthyosaurs. The stocky body of these large animals would also have been a factor. The larger size of their bodies allowed for more muscles to drive these flippers, and many plesiosaur skeletons have fossil bones located on their ventral sides similar to certain tyrannosaurids, and some paleontologists believe that those bones were part of a structure holding up massive muscles. How fast could a plesiosaur like Liplorodon swim? Well, estimations comparing different animals suggest that most plesiosaurids were around 20% slower than an ichthyosaur, but around 5% faster than a mosasaur. Short-necked animals like Liplorodon were likely faster than their long-necked cousins, which were built for speed. Elasmosaurus, for example, a long-necked plesiosaur has short, stubby flippers, which would have been useless for speed, but would have given increased roll speed and therefore helped agility. One of the biggest arguments when it comes to plesiosaurs is whether they gave birth to live young or laid eggs on land. For a long time, it was assumed that plesiosaurs would haul themselves onto dry land to lay eggs like turtles. However, in 1987, a fossil plesiosaur called Polycotylus was discovered with a fossil of a fully developed young inside. This has been used as evidence of live birthing in plesiosaurs. It is, however, the only current example known. Given how large some of these animals grew, it seems doubtful they could have survived on land for any length of time. So let's look at size in more detail. And boy, is Liplorodon a complicated one. The exact size of many animals in a fossil record is often difficult to ascertain. This is due to many factors, and it's especially a problem with large apex predators like Liplorodon. Large apex predators are rare in the food chain, which means there are fewer of them, and as a result, there are much fewer fossilised remains to then use as a guide for estimations of size. Paleontologist L.B. Tarlow suggested that the length of a pliosaur can be estimated by taking the length of its skull, which was around one seventh the size of the full animal. Using this ratio and applying it to Liplorodon, we get an estimated maximum length of about 10 meters, with a more common length of around 5 to 7. However, looking at other pliosaurs such as Cronosaurus, a ratio of 1 in 5 seems more likely. This would bring Liplorodon's estimated length down to around 7 meters or so. So was that 25 meter long beast we saw in Walking with Dinosaurs completely impossible? The Oxford University Museum of Natural History did have a jaw on display that measured around 3 meters long, and which would have come from a skull of around 3.6 meters long. Using the Cronosaurus estimate, that would give an animal of around 18 meters in length in total. However, while this jaw was initially declared part of an animal known as Liopleurodon macromerus, this jaw was eventually reclassified as belonging to a new animal, Pliosaurus. However, this did not happen until 2003. It's likely that this jaw was where walking with dinosaurs got its massive estimate from. However, hope for a supersized magical Liopleurodon are not completely gone. Remains dug up from the Kimmeridge clay formation in England support the existence of a pliosaur larger than any known Liopleurodon, possibly up to 25 meters in length. However, as of today, these remains have not been described or linked to any particular species. Something that is important to remember is that the fossil evidence we have for many species is often very incomplete, and like modern reptiles, Liplorodon would never stop growing as it aged. So perhaps the 150 year old supersized Liplorodon re-sea in cruel sea really did exist. Who knows? 
So what was the world of Lyplorodon like? Well, much of where it lived in Europe and England was still largely submerged underwater during the Jurassic period. During the Jura Jurassic, great landmass movements caused massive changes to the sea floors, pushing up sea levels which flooded most of Europe creating the ancient and famous Tethys Ocean. This ancient ocean would be prevalent in much of the fossil record of the Mesozoic, eventually disappearing in the millions of years after the end of the dinosaur's reign. Lyplorodon shared these waters with many other ancient animals. Ammonites would have been common with their thick shells, but they probably offered little protection against the jaws of Lyplorodon. Other species of plesiosaurs would have been common. Animals like Cryptoclidus, a long-necked plesiosaur would be common here. The supersized fish, Leedicthes, probably lived in the deeper waters, sifting krill. They would have shared these waters with aquatic crocodiles, fish, squids, and more. On the scattered England islands above, dinosaurs like the stegosaurid Lexovisaurus and the predator Metriacanthosaurus would have staked out a living on these scattered islands. Lyplorodon, like all seagoing reptiles, was an air breather. It would have come to the surface to breathe before descending, likely staying low to the seabed, scanning the sea above for potential prey. Upon finding a source of food, it would have probably used all four of its flippers in one powerful giant attack, ambushing its prey before it knew what had hit it, using those huge teeth to tear off chunks of flesh and dismember the unfortunate target. Who were the targets for Lyplorodon? Well, fossilised remains in other plesiosaurs indicate that fish, squids, and other similar creatures were on the menu, but ichthyosaurs and other plesiosaurs were also there. In fact, there have even been bite marks found on plesiosaur skeletons that match other pliosaurs like Lyplorodon. It's likely that this big bad guy would have attacked and eaten anything it wanted to. However, Lyplorodon itself, along with the plesiosaurs in general, would see a decline as the Cretaceous period drew on, with the sleek, snake-like mosasaurs evolving to fill the same roles. And of course, by the time of the end of the dinosaurs, the plesiosaurs and the pliosaurs would be doomed to extinction, unable to adapt to the changes brought on by the asteroid impact. Lyoplorodon, for me, is still one of my most favourite of all marine reptiles. Some of that is probably thanks to the nostalgia I still have for it, thanks to walking with dinosaurs. However, it's clear I'm not the only one. Many Lyoplorodon reconstructions use the same black and white marbled body colours, and it was one of the few marine reptiles depicted in Ark Survival Evolved. It also gained a hid following, thanks to a certain group of unicorns, and it remains my favourite marine reptile of all time. If I had to choose between having a dinosaur and having a Lyplorodon, I would pick a Lyplorodon every time. So, what do you guys think of Lyplorodon? Do you remember the first time it was on TV? Are you excited to see it in Jurassic World Evolution 2? Let me know in the comments down below. Next time, we're going to take a walk much further back in time, leaving the dinosaurs behind, to look at a sail-backed predator which, while it might not ever show up in a Jurassic World Evolution game, is one of the most famous prehistorical animals ever. However, until then, don't forget to check out the rest of the Beyond the Park series and the other videos on Tricolor Gaming. I'll see you next time.